To many, re-gifting an unwanted present is rude, ungrateful, and a little miserly. However, to Roy Collette and Larry Kunkel, it was not only a treasured Christmas time tradition that they upheld for well over two decades, but an ever-escalating and elaborate game to see which one would fail to be able to re-gift the pair of pants in question first. The origins of this trousers-based tale go all the way back to the 1960s, when Larry Kunkel's well-meaning mother gave him a pair of yellow-brown moleskin pants one Christmas while he was studying at St. Cloud State University, believing that they'd keep him warm during the winter. Kunkel wore the pants they reported three times, before realizing that in the harsh, unforgiving Minnesotan winters he had to endure at university, the pants would stiffen rather uncomfortably. So the following year, Kunkel re-gifted the pants to his brother-in-law, Roy Collette, who spotted a rather similar build. Like Kunkel, Colette found that the pants were uncomfortable during winter, and lo and behold, Kunkel found the pants under his Christmas tree the very next year. This amused Kunkel, and for several years, the two continued to exchange the pants each Christmas until Colette had the bright idea to roll the pants up as tightly as he could and cram them into a small, three-foot-long, one-inch-wide pipe. Colette saw this move as a joke. Kunkel, on the other hand, saw it as a challenge. Wanting to outdo his brother, a year later, Kunkel took the pants, folded them into a tiny square, and wrapped them tightly with several dozen feet of steel wire. Colette rose to the challenge admirably, freeing the pants before putting them into a wooden box filled with rocks that he then nailed shut and had banded with strips of steel. Colette patiently waited for a year before dutifully delivering the box to Kunkel on Christmas Eve. And thus, a game was afoot. Who could successfully put the pants in a container so unwieldy that the other wouldn't be able to get them out to re-gift them the next year? To keep things interesting and sporting over the years, the two men agreed to a number of rules. First, if the pants were damaged, either while being wrapped or unwrapped, the game would end and the loser would be the one who damaged them. Another rule was that neither man could spend any money wrapping the pants, and they just agreed to use only junk parts or things there lying around. Further, delivery expenses had to be kept to an absolute minimum. Finally, it was agreed that they had to wrap the pants in a way that they felt was morally, legally, and spiritually correct, given the spirit of the game. And so it was that the two men came up with increasingly fiendish ways to wrap the pants to make it all the more difficult for the recipient to get them out. For example, after receiving the pants inside of the stone-filled box, Kunkel returns them, mounted inside a window, complete with a 20-year guarantee, and sent them back. Colette's response was to put the pants in a coffee can, which she then put in an oil drum, which she then filled with reinforced concrete. As the wrapping efforts became more and more elaborate, the yearly tradition came to the attention of local newspapers and business owners who were only too happy to help the men try and outdo one another, often footing the delivery cost on their behalf. Some of the more outrageous wrapping efforts included a 600-pound safe that had been welded shut and covered in seasonal festive wrapping. A truck tire filled with concrete and in a 1974 Gremlins glove compartment. If that last one doesn't sound that bad, we should point out that Kunkel had the car crushed into a three foot wide cube before delivering it with a note stating that the pants were in the glove compartment. Perhaps getting annoyed at the countless hours spent carefully extracting the pants without damaging them, one year Colette tried to get Kunkel to stop the game, suggesting that they gift the pants back to his mother. Colette liked this idea and had the pants sealed inside so-called bulletproof glass and sent them to Kunkel to pass on to his mother. That Christmas, Kunkel delivered a car filled with concrete to Colette's house and told him that the pants, still inside the bulletproof glass, were inside. In 1985, Colette had the pants inside a giant four-ton concrete Rubik's cube that he then covered with 2,000 board feet of lumber. In 1986, Kunkel returned the pants inside a car to which he had welded over a hundred generators that Colette had to meticulously take apart to find the pants somewhere within without damaging them. No source we could find mentions exactly what the pants were housed in for the two years following that, but we do know what happened in 1989 when it was, once again, Colette's turn to wrap the pants. After some deliberation, Colette decided to seal the pants inside of an insulated container that would then itself be sealed inside over 10,000 pounds of glass. Colette had all of the kinks worked out and had even managed to convince a friend in charge of a glass manufacturing company to supply the glass free of charge so that he wouldn't break any of the rules by spending any money. However, the tragedy struck when the insulation for the pants failed while molten glass was being poured over them, causing them to burst into flames. A heartbroken Colette, now officially the loser of the over two decade long game, swept up the ashes and placed them in an urn which he had delivered to Kunkel that year with a note that read, Sorry old man, here lies the pants. An attempt to cast the pants in glass brought about the demise of the pants at last. Kunkel graciously accepted the urn and placed it on the mantel above his fireplace. 
However, Colette was worried that Kunkel would continue the game with the urn, being quoted as saying, Larry's the most competitive person I know. I won't be surprised if I get the ashes back in something next year. However, as far as we can tell, he never got the pants back, and they currently enjoy a rather quiet, burnt-up life in an urn. And now for some bonus facts. In the 1983 interview with the New York Times about the tradition, Colette, whose turn it was to receive the pants that year, claimed that he was sort of disappointed because Kunkel had recently built a house. He stated, If I could, I would have put them in the foundation of his house or under the fireplace or something. Then we'd sit there on Christmas Eve, warming ourselves by the fire, and I'd just point down at the floor and tell him where they were. One would think, given the expense of extracting the pants from the home's foundation, that this would have made Colette the victor, but alas, it wasn't his turn. And now for another bonus fact. Speaking of funny stories surrounding pants, on January the 5th, 1825, a 23-year-old Alexander Dumas, soon to be famed playwright and novelist, and current son of Thomas Alexander, who was once one of Napoleon's generals, was slated to take part in a duel. The duel was instigated a few days before when Dumas was having dinner at the Palais Royal with a group of friends. After eating, they decided to head out to smoke and play billiards at a local cafe. While at the cafe, a soldier who was playing billiards made a joke at Dumas' expense, particularly making fun of Dumas' cloak and boots. Like any good Frenchman of the day, Dumas didn't take this slight on his honor lightly, and a duel was set for a few days later, much to the chagrin of Dumas' friends who didn't fancy him going up against a trained soldier. Dumas proceeded to practice shooting with his second and proved to be a good shot, but this turned out for naught as it was decided that the duel would be fought with swords. Luckily, Dumas was not only a great shot, but also a decent enough fencer, though his confidence in this arena was much less so than with a gun. At the appointed time, Dumas showed up for the duel armed with his father's sword, and his rival was nowhere to be found. After further investigation, it was discovered that his opponent had slept through the time of the duel, so it was rescheduled for the following day at a quarry near Montmartre in Paris. On the day of the duel, it was extremely cold, and there was significant snow on the ground. Once a suitable location within the quarry was chosen, Dumas' opponents asked that Dumas take off not only his jacket, but also his vest and shirt. While doing this, Dumas also removed his suspenders, at which point his pants fell down. A crowd of quarry workers had gathered and had a good laugh at Dumas' expense over this, but this time he was at least sensible enough not to challenge them all to duels. Rather, he simply tied up his pants with his suspenders, and the two opponents went on guard. Once the duel began, Dumas immediately managed to strike on the man's shoulder. His opponent was not seriously wounded by Dumas. However, the man tripped on a route and fell after jumping back. By the man's own admission, he jumped back from astonishment of how cold the blade was on his skin rather than the blow that Dumas had delivered. Dumas had previously placed the tip in the snow while partially undressing. Now on the ground, rather than continue the duel, the soldier yielded and the duel was over without anyone being killed or seriously injured. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel, Biographics? I'm going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.